in case you missed my name, uh, it's pacing. I have all this blah blah stuff on the second line. Currently, I am with I'm an independent consultant uh, with organization resiliency management, but I'm not here to sell anything. All right, and. Uh, I also work with the business continuity chapter of the Singapore Computer Society as the uh, exco secretary. So in case, and I highly encourage you to sign up as a member, please call me. Okay. Again, I'm not selling anything, only if you want it. Yeah. Um, you may experience some uh, technical glitches today. I am very new to Ubuntu, but I'm learning how to use it on this little baby. And as you can see, I'm also trying out some other tools. Uh, so, are you guys good? And I proceed. So, the idea today is to talk about audit, how an auditor looks at DevSecOps. But it is not an instinctive kiss or kill uh, decision because the same with us, with me as an auditor looking at DevSecOps, uh, the auditees themselves are also looking at the auditor coming through the door and then they have to decide should I kill this person, silence her or maybe I try and hug it out with him or her or whatever it is, right? So, uh, if you talk to an auditor about DevSecOps, this is actually their first reaction, right? Huh? And then because we are more used to hearing stuff like this Okay, but it's not important for you to read everything in there, so that's why it's all jumbled up. But the idea of it, why we got a, uh, is that the, it's not defined. It's a cloud, it's a bunch of smoke, and we really need something that is a bit more structured so that we know, okay, what are we trying to compare it to? Because that's what the audit is about, right? So for purpose of today's, for the next, hopefully, 10 to 15 minutes, Okay, um, we need to talk about it in a context. So, I have taken the liberty to choose one. Okay, and it's this, right? Um, anyone not familiar with what this thing is? All right, so just a quick one for those. Uh, this is uh, the Information Security Management Standard published by uh, ISO, which is International Standards Organization. <coughs> and as with all international standard organizations, they are in Switzerland, right? This, uh, it gives you uh, not only a management system framework, it gives you in the index a whole host uh, of domains where you should look at as hygiene factors for your security controls. So that's the quick and easy of 14 pages. Um, the reason I pick uh, 27,000 is that as with all ISO management standards, this is their ancestor, okay, a damning cycle. Coincidentally, the ancestry of Agile also comes from damning cycle. Okay, so we are not that far away. At least we establish, you know, we, we used to come from the same place. Okay, so um, I want to uh, just introduce the people who are not yet familiar with this term uh, management system. Uh, in 27,000 or in any of the ISO management standards, we don't deal with systems uh, in terms of, oh, it's an email system, this is a chat system, blah, blah. We, we don't think of system at this level. We are talking about uh, a management system for the whole organization, meaning, other than this, okay, is that these processes that interact with each other, they are established. So someone has an idea or there is a clear idea of what it is. It is implemented, put into job, and uh, maintained and continually improving. So this is like the basic requirement that any ISO management standard will have. Right? So, uh, on the first, I think on the first or second section of every standard, you will also see them mention something about process approach. So many years ago, <laughs> when this was first mentioned in the ISO standards, it was because we wanted to solve this problem. 
okay. The different departments, they were doing things on their own and those processes that span departments were not performing. They, they were not flowing well. They went, when they pass from one department to another department, it gets stuck. Okay. So the whole idea of um, looking at the organization as a management system is just that for those processes that span departments, the, the walls are taken down. And from the input to the output, the very end of the process, there is some communication throughout and you have your product produced at the very end which has some value added to it. So this argument is not so strange, right? For if you have been to DevOps uh, conferences or talks, it's nothing new. But weirdly, it's coming from a standard that's supposed to pull you down, right? Supposed to pull you down. So, what do standards see themselves as? We're kind of a door wedge, okay? Because for this is actually taken from ISO as well. You might see it. Um, the standard pins what is the minimum of the benchmark, right? If you read standards, normally they won't say you must uh, you must have password security. Your password must be minimum eight characters, alphanumeric, complex, blah blah. Usually they don't say that. They just say look at password security. So there is a specification of the minimum. And with every revision of the standard, it tries to push the benchmark a little higher, a little higher, and a little higher. And hopefully, all the organizations that subscribe to this standard, they get pushed upwards as well. Okay, but of course, it's a long time. So, back to this thing about uh, auditing DevSecOps. Um, let's say I'm forced to audit DevSecOps for whatever reason. Okay. As an auditor, my instinct is to go look at what are the processes that happen in DevSecOps. But is it really any different? Do you not have change management? Do you not have service updates? Or is it that you do not have any kind of authentication? It's not that. So mostly to auditors, uh, without a lack of any kind of a framework that's being defined for DevSecOps, these are the things that we instinctively go for. And we will ask you, what exactly is the audit reference you want me to take, right? So it's as if it's very simple, right? You go out, every SDLC has many, many things. So yeah, every phase has their own processes. Not a problem, but I know I'm making it sound very easy. Eh? For those who have gone through ISMS audits, you'll be like, huh, this girl is trying to smoke me, right? Okay, things are not so easy. I still get a whole load of findings. What's the deal? So, uh, if you take a closer look at the findings, right, this is what you might find. Okay. The standard, like I say, it gives you a public benchmark. Hmm, am I blocking? Maybe I should come over here. Okay. And what you get mostly, okay, that, that most people understand from audit report are things that they say, oh, the standard says this, but you didn't do this. So that belongs to this category of findings. But you also get another category that most auditors uh, actually find. So that would be your procedures say this, but you only do this, they don't match up or your procedure says, oh, I'm going to get 100% of something, but you only get 80%. So these are the kind of findings most of the time you will see in the audit report. Something that doesn't come up on the audit report, but sometimes is suggested from when the auditor writes AOIs, area of improvements or suggestions or something like that, which for you as auditee, you don't necessarily have to agree on or have to put into action, is this one. Okay. Reality and standards are not the same. Simply because uh, by the time someone gets through thinking about something, that reality is over. Right? 
And standards themselves, they have a very, especially the ones on a global scale, they have a very long update cycle. For example, uh, ISO 27001 that we are talking about, uh, review cycle is five years, but the voting, the, the redrafting, the review, going through the different countries, getting a new uh, standard published takes about anywhere between six to eight years. So by the time uh, a standard is actually published, you are probably looking at some time capsule thing that was almost 10 years ago, right? But it's how it works. Because on a global scale, I can't just say, all right, I see it happening in Singapore. It doesn't matter. So Singapore is you know, working good in Singapore. I put it in the standard. It doesn't work this way. Because they have to think about, uh, on a bigger scale, how can they make things better at the bottom line. But there's also one last kind of findings that uh, is quite irritating to auditors and auditees. And that is nuisance findings. Okay. <laughs> Seriously, there are new I am an auditor and I can tell you there are always uh, potential nuisance findings. These are findings that happen on the audit report. You, know, you see people write, 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 but no matter how you go for it, no matter how you dig, no matter how you ask, no matter how you investigate, no good comes out from it. Right? There's no value that you can, any, you can reap from trying to find out why this thing happened. Okay. And such findings, I, I can give you an example, very often is um, an auditor asks an engineer, uh, do you have a process for managing your system? And the engineer says, yes, 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 yes. And he proceeds to dig his files for something. And then he realizes uh, he doesn't know where it is. And the auditor says, never mind. Take your time. I'll be here until tomorrow. You can always give it to me before I write the report. And he says, fine, fine, fine. And two days later, still cannot find that particular document. And no choice. <coughs> auditor puts it down as, a, oh, evidence is not present. But the day after the auditor leaves, okay, a colleague of the engineer comes back to work and says, huh, it's here, right in my drawer. So what kind of good will come out if you try to correct? You know, if you try to dig, dig, dig something like this? Maybe just that these guys don't have a proper documentation sharing platform. But really, is it that or is it that you need to educate people more on how and what to do? So sometimes you do get nuisance findings. Uh, Auditees who get too nervous and then they, they uh, jam up and then after that, no choice. Auditors also don't like to give this kind of findings because one year later or half a year later, when we come back and we realize that we have to close the finding, we feel quite stupid about it. <laughs> All right. So Another form of nuisance finding actually comes from something we call loss in translation. And this actually happens quite a lot in IT. Um, it's when we ask for, uh, for example, this, this particular one that I'm, I'm trying to show is that I'm asking for how do you uh, set up and operate your system. And then as the engineer, he comes out and see my network diagram, my architecture diagram, see very nice, all well drawn, you see. He even has branch A, branch B. And then as the auditor, I, I stand there and I'm like, OK, I very good architecture. I, I, I like your drawing. It's very nice. So how do you run it? You know, how did you set this up? How do you know you should? have branch A with this, and you have branch A or branch B with that. Blah. And then the engineer jams up because uh, he, doesn't re he really doesn't know what to say. right? Because whatever he says, 
he's afraid that uh, I, I might say something wrong because suddenly he's confronted with a fact, you know, a, a piece of thing that he was so confident in actually tells the auditor very little. <laughs> right. So this is, this is really one of the common problems. Um, in fact, I myself experienced when I was auditing in my last company. Okay. Uh, and it doesn't just happen uh, that auditee has a problem. Okay. It also happens the other way. An auditor steps into an environment and he is lost. Because systems nowadays are so massive, so complicated. You know, instead of sitting down to audit, he probably takes the better half of a day to just find out, to just understand what the business is about, what the engineer is trying to do with the things that are in his charge. So that, in actual fact, takes up a lot of his time and takes up a lot of his brain power. And some auditors do get very flustered by it. So, in this war against your auditor, may or may not, you know, who is your real ally? It is your compliance department if you have one. If you don't have one, then it is your product owner. Because uh, these are the people that can give you a direction on what to do, what not to do, and why should we not do something. Okay. The idea, sorry, you... Sorry. Owner is responsible for compliance. Let's say if product owner is not aware about the what is the requirement for the compliance, then what? Okay. You see that that is the thing. You you're you're talking about a case where I don't have a compliance person and then my product owner is uh, is the kind that I look at the spec, if the spec doesn't say we don't do kind of thing. Then I would say do point number two, right? Bring competencies up to par. Bring them to SMU. Talk to Angela. Talk to Amelia. Okay. <laughs> Understand what it is that they really need to do. Need to go and learn. Because there, it is nothing bad about learning, right? And uh, it, 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 there's nothing bad about going to school. Especially when school is so nice right in the middle of Singapore, right? See, Amelia, Angela goes like. <laughs> So, it is, it is okay. Someone just has to take up this role of ensuring that, you know, uh, the compliance part of it is being looked at. Okay. You don't want someone to be in charge of auditing. That is really not a value-added job. I'm, I'm an auditor, so... Okay. But when you're doing production, you're doing deployment, audit is not really a value-added job. And also, if you guys were listening to Amelia uh, just now, she was also talking about uh, having many service providers, having many tools. It's easy to get lost. And when you swim in them, it's very likely that if you have not been swimming intelligently, you will be flooded. Okay. And when you get to the point that you have to explain to someone how this big architecture of yours were where some portions you have asked a third provider to build for you or you have implemented something open source or if you have put in uh, people to come and support you in your operation processes it's difficult and it takes time and it takes patience so it's it's not always smooth sailing that doesn't contribute to a very nice audit experience you know, when when actually all the auditor wants is sit down with a cup of coffee, look at staff, finish his coffee and walk out the door. You know, just, just end up with a report. And basically what you see in purple is extract from the manifesto. <laughs> and something that I think really, really makes sense. Um, it is not, if you can, if you read the whole of the manifesto, nowhere does it say that you should do audit. And the worst thing that you can potentially do is if you treat audit like uh, activity that you, that you can revolutionize like all the other activities in the SDLC like testing, like integration. You know. Now the trend is what? 
continuous testing, continuous integration, continuous deployment, but nowhere you can do continuous audit. No such thing. Okay. It, it doesn't help you in your deployment cycle. It will just slow you down. Anyways, if you go for audit, you will have findings. So are you going to be always looking at your findings, trying to fix them before you deploy? It doesn't make sense. We are going backwards, right? So uh, we are approaching the end. Bear with me. Okay. Some of the auditors new to uh, DevOps, we sometimes feel this way. Okay. So uh, I'm, I'm glad I get the chance to speak. And I'm thankful that everybody gives me a chance to learn. Um, so maybe, just maybe, we, we, we do have a chance to hug it out with uh, the rest of the DevOps community. <laughs> okay. And I hope I have convinced you about this. Again, um, the auditor, we are really the ones that see the work at the last. Okay. The developer sees it, the tester sees it, you know, product owner sees it, customer sees it. But when does the auditor actually get to see the results of that work? We are actually the very last. And in fact, when you have a system that is you know, gone to the end of the life cycle, the auditor could be potentially the last person to look at it just before you kill it, you know, just to have historical records, see how it was made, but that's it, right? So if you want to be proactive, the auditor is not the guy to talk to, right? And so um, I'm very really at the end of my talk. I, I hope I haven't been too fast. And uh, this is a personal call out to everybody. Okay, uh, Compliance <coughs> folks do need some love. And we have empty space, as you can see. So at the next DevSecOps meetup in June, please Bring someone, bring someone uh, from your compliance party. If you don't have someone from a compliance party, bring someone who will be audited. It's easy, just, just bring them. Okay. Uh, it's a bit like marriage counseling. You, know, you, 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 have a, you have a misunderstanding or you have something with, with the other party and you bring them to this group and we can do some group therapy together, right? So. Uh, that's it from me. Okay, so now back to what you guys were helping me with learn. Okay, this is if you if you need to look for me. By the way, send this is another QR code for my LinkedIn. Uh, let's go back to that survey. All right. So so we had already had this. So let's see. Uh, I'm on air. <laughs> okay. I actually have some interesting, yeah, yeah, interesting things to. <coughs> uh, I I will make this available to organizers, huh? <laughs> okay. So, all right. Let me see. Do you guys get the next? Uh, do you guys get the next question? No. So you can vote on the next question now. Where is my continuous testing tool? Okay. Good. Getting this? Yeah. So the reason I'm asking this question is that uh, these are this group of people, they are not involved with product design. They are not involved with building the product. And they are not involved with the compliance or even so pro this group of people probably don't even see. But if they don't move their ass, you can't work. So do we bring these people in to this group therapy session? I know in, in a lot of, I mean, I, I was from a fairly big company myself. Uh, procurement always seems to be in the way they always have something to complain about. But 
here, in if we want to have a sharing culture, collaborative culture, do we bring them? Good. Let's have a look. Wow. Okay. So you guys also know what to do. Uh. If you cannot find a compliance person, you cannot find an auditee, some guy who's going to be audited, you bring one from procurement. Okay. And most of the time, procurement are nice ladies. You can bring. <laughs> right? Okay, is that it? Okay, seems like it's very difficult for no to catch up. Uh. So let's, let's go on to the next question. Okay, do I have? Question three is on air. Okay, this question is more because I'm, I'm interested. Uh, you know, Asian culture has a reputation for being a little bit close when it comes to adopting new things and talking because we don't like our bosses or our colleagues to think that we made a mistake or we didn't do things good, or we are just plain stubborn. So maybe a quick vote here. And let's have a look. Oh? Huh? Really? <laughs> really, really. Was invented in Singapore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, this, this is this is pretty interesting, right? This is pretty refresh. Oh, okay. If you go to like Job Street or whatever, a lot of jobs are for uh, looking for DevOps actually at the moment. Depending on what that means to people. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Who? I mean, what 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 did you vote for? Yes. No. Yes. Yes. The most difficult places in the world, and I've traveled all around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And yourself? What What do you think? Why is it? Why does the local culture make things a little bit? I think there are different companies, uh, but mm -hmm. uh, younger or I don't know. DBS is also hiring DevOps people. Yeah, DBS always hiring DevOps people. So what? Yeah, uh, I voted no. First of all. Uh, yeah, uh, just to give a reason. Uh, it's not about the local culture uh, because I've been to US, Canada, and uh, China also. Uh, it's not the local culture, but it's the development culture more uh, uh, make a behavior change, you know. So the way development works or the way operation works all around the world is the same. So uh -huh. uh, when you are trying to implement DevSec ops or DevOps, what you say, it's not about the local uh, people culture, it's all, it's all about the, uh, the technical culture, I would say, how they used to develop our software, how they used to deploy the software. Uh, how, how they used to operate the software, right? So I think it's more about the technical culture rather than the local culture. I think that that is also quite true. If because for for teams, maybe you have different teams, and every team, no matter how small, they have their own little culture because they are they are their own yeah. little clique, yes. it's right? In our organization, yeah. But that makes it difficult. Yeah, yeah, but it's not about the local culture. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's, it's not, not about the local, local culture. That's what you're saying. It's about the organization yeah. culture or culture, technical culture, how you have in your organization. So, if we extend from there, it also means that regardless of where your business operates, you can push this yep. cultural thing. Okay. Uh, I, I, I talked to some people at a DevOps place I was at recently, and they'd say, uh, DevOps, this movement is bottom up. Okay, it, it tries to make all the, the people come together and then that bubbles up to management or bubbles up to the rest of the world. So really, I think this this just by way of extension proves that it can be done. Because the, the scores are very close. Okay, last last refresh and let's see. Okay. All right, so um, can I just take questions on anything that I mentioned? Yes, please. Yes. My dear colleague. Okay, so I just wanted to understand something from the auditor perspective. Yes. I'm not an auditor, but I'm trying to understand how auditors work. 
Yeah, because you you are trying to satisfy yeah, the auditor. Yeah, because I am a product developer. Mm. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay, so uh, you talked about ISO two seven zero zero one and other standards that you guys are uh, following. So. Uh, I, I am pretty sure, like I can understand from your presentation, that uh, you cannot go through all the yeah, all the steps so mentioned over here, right? Yeah. So, so what are the basic compliance steps that you follow while you audit a, a engineering IT system team or a development team? Like the basic three or four points that is must from is your a must. from your perspective. Like what do you um, looking for? Um. Well. Uh, if given anything no. and says pacing go audit okay first of all like i mentioned i need to know what i'm comparing against it's a process of comparison yes. right so we usually in the process we will look for what we call objective evidence okay this evidence must not be something that someone just wrote down five minutes ago okay it has to be some artifact from your work so perhaps uh, your you you have a you have a design you have an architecture you have some uh, meeting minutes of your team members going at each other and then you arrive at a decision because of what 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 so it's your it's your logic it's your reasoning how you arrive at doing something that that we definitely want to have it doesn't have to be pages and pages mm -hmm. okay and uh, how do you get to the so, so one of your slides, a couple of the slides talked about standard and benchmarking. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, like, as you said, right, it takes like uh, your ISO takes like around few years, more than like Five half a decade years. to come up. And like, as far as I know, right, uh, waterfall to agile to DevOps happened in the last seven or eight years. Uh, so uh, in that sense, like, how, how do you even do a standardizing? How do you get a benchmark? Yeah. So if you read, uh, if you look at, in, in this context of the ISO management standards, right? If you read the standard, you'll realize it doesn't tell you what to do. Right, exactly. Yeah, or how to do. It just tells you, look at this area, look at this area, look at this area. But the how and what to do about it, you decide. So any anyone who <coughs> wants to subscribe to such a, a system, they will say, okay, I just need to make sure I hit this domain, hit this domain, hit this domain. I need to document how my processes interact with each other, definitely. Because it is the concept of your organization. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, so, so that answers the question, right? But again, like, uh, <coughs> I mean, every organization, like someone just talked about, right? Mm -hmm. They have their different uh, development culture, engineering culture, processes, and all. So, in that case, how does <coughs> this? Uh, how are you able to implement uh, like an in industry standard? Very good question. Because industry standard, there is no standard that audits culture. <laughs> 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 but every standard aims to become culture. Is is the same. If you if you look at it, you know, no matter you are talking about information security or you're talking about uh, what environmental management, you're <coughs> talking about emission carbon emissions, you're talking about business continuity. They always say the best outcome is if the spirit of the standard becomes part of your organization culture. They are not looking for hard compliance. If I say A, you have A, B, you have B, this kind. They're not looking for this. Rather, auditors want to see that the spirit of a recommended control has been internalized by the group as a whole. You, you will always not see perfection. It's, it's difficult. And anyways, the process of auditing right, is if you are facing an external auditor, they are only with you for a certain number of days. And within those days, they have to check a huge spectrum of domains, which is not easy. So they will do uh, a sampling process. Of course, this sampling process, it has to be a reasonable sample size, okay, for enough for them to write, to have that confidence to write in their report that, okay, we've sampled so much. And it does indicate that 
the process is within the control limits. That's it. Yeah. But on the other hand, okay, the topic of today's speech, which we were talking about internal auditor, right? internal auditor plays a different game. Because internal auditor is someone in a unique position to understand uh, what this organization is doing. Because they are part of the organization, they are familiar with uh, the business, they are familiar with the business objectives that we want to achieve. So for them, usually they will do a more in-depth check and they don't sample areas. Normally they check every area, but sample each process. I, I hope that helps you. Thank you so much. And uh, so, last one is I am just. Okay. I need some feedback loop, right? So if you if you guys can put it. This last one. Haha. <laughs> So, if you if you like my talk, please give me a star. If not, then I thank you for your attention and for your participation. Yes, sorry. Oh, more yeah. questions. So sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. <laughs> yes. Um, <coughs> I have a simple one. I'm coming from a world of proof that I live in every day. I do something, it works. Proof. Yeah. And someone wants something, I was a developer for a long time, I'm an economist by, by profession, so it's always that we like to see things as if they were real, and then there comes the audit and we don't know, do we turn left, do we turn right, what is it that they want, what is going on, and <coughs> One day I, 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 I had this understanding, it, did, it didn't last very long, but I had this understanding that, okay, so if there's a standard, then it imposes some thoughts on the, on the company, saying, okay, we, our business deals with customer login data, we have to do something about this login data, we have to decide how we want to deal with this. So you create kind of a, a, a white ball of white balls, and then you, you, you write on those balls. Um, <coughs> we have to sort the values, we have to save them in a secure location, we have to make sure that physically nobody can run off with the hard disk that they are stored on, things like that. Right? <coughs> and that is actually the work that you don't need to do yourself. There are frameworks out there that come with bunches and bunches of and balls with balls inside and then we just have to sit down and say okay take this ball do we do it or don't we do it and that's a management decision it's a management decision that i have learned um, managers often run away from because this implies security this implies risk for their own position right. so they don't really want to take a decision there but then <coughs> you get into this trouble because there are now balls that are running around, that roll around between the balls that you put them in. We implement, don't implement. If we implement, how do we do it? We have to write it down how to do it. And we do it that way that we decided to do it. And then it's, it's, it's becoming pretty easy. But you know the, the, <coughs> the problem arises from the fact that we can't see what are the fucking balls that they are giving us? What are they about? But that, yeah. Where, how big? You know, they, in they in a way, to, that, that also move, implies uh, that certain managers <coughs> have no Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. They I, try I, to get I rid can of them. Okay. <laughs> 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 I mean, they. they <coughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I just want to quickly, yes. uh, you're on your last slide of conclusion. Yes. Did I read it right? You, it looks like you made a bold stance of no audit for DevSecOps? No, not no audit, okay. no continuous auditing. You continuously comply mm -hmm. at some point at <coughs> all points of your SDLC. Do mm -hmm. not keep, because the idea of audit is I check whether something has been done in a certain way. So it's like a double check. So why would you want to keep checking 
for something that you should have already performed correctly at the very beginning. You, you get what I mean? I mean, it depends. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you look at a very traditional view of how audits are done today, mm -hmm. and, and agree, there is no defined process for DevSecOps today. You know, it's evolving. And I think all organizations are, I think, trying to establish an effective auditing methodology. Uh, how to know whether the organization's DevOps community are doing the right things, are in a controlled fashion and things like that. So it's evolving, I, I get that. Uh, but, but if you look at audit as a human-driven activity, mm. then yes, you know, you can't do this continuous audit. You can't have a person in every yeah. And anyway, that person will be very depressed. I think that deals with the concept of automation in DevOps, right? I think the way you need to look at audit is different in DevSecOps, in my opinion. As far as you demonstrate that you have exercised, you have tested that control in an automated manner mm -hmm. and have produced a result that can be verified, it doesn't have to be done by a human auditor. It can be proven yep. that control exists, and that's the essence, I believe, in automation. Mm -hmm. That I don't need gates of approvals, yeah. right? But, Unless you're but approved. you need to know, right, if the automation is correct or not. Uh, absolutely. So, so for example, you see the you see the recent Volkswagen scandals, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a completely an automation framework that was developed in the late nineties. Mm -hmm. uh, to take care of the entire emission cycle. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. the programmers of the framework actually uh, were told to put in certain mechanisms to escape the uh, entire environmental uh, regulation. Yeah, but stuff, automation right? doesn't mean no one should check, right? right. There's always exactly. an underlying so what he said, right, we were talking about the DBS bank, right? Still at the end of the day, that goddamn AI that DBS bank is using is programmed by a human being, right? Yeah, everything is programmed by human beings. Yeah, so, so if an auditor is not, auditor is basically what I understand from her, right? Is a human being who is interjecting in the process, which is handled by a bunch of human beings, which is like the developers, the managers, everyone, right? So she is just like trying to reflect a mirror as to whether we are following the proper processes or not, right? So if you said like we are doing automation as a developer, I can write like 10,000 lines of code and I can make some gaps in the automation framework according to the company's requirement, right? Business requirement. So how does it comply with the regulations? Like say if these methods were probably followed to, or, or I would say like if there were proper auditing mechanisms uh, from automation framework, right? So Volkswagen wouldn't fall in the problem they failed to do, right? So, so what do you say, right? I, I beg to disagree because I, I don't think all there is. I mean, yeah, if, if profit, I can, I guess, but automation has. Its yeah. Just because things are automated doesn't mean they cannot be audited. Uh, which, which I actually agree. Yes, Suman. Uh, I want to add one point here. Uh, see, well, it's a nice presentation, first of all, uh, because I oh, closely you. I can see that uh, recently we have gone through uh, ISO 27001 audit, and because we are completely moved to DevSecOps or DevOps. So how auditors are basically doing the actual audit, what uh, you are pointing out, is right. Uh, it's not uh, whether it's automation, whether it's a manual process, but auditors, uh, as you said, it's a one man statement. You should be doing performing a secure code review or something, right? So when auditors ask us, they ask us, uh, give us the uh, evidence which shows that in DevSecOps, what you have implemented, you are getting the secure code review, review uh, generated with a daily build or probably weekly build or probably a monthly build, but give us the evidence that your automation is working fine. Exactly. And those kind of evidence, basically auditors, we are presenting to auditors yeah. uh, for ISO 20 design Okay, okay. Uh, I, I mean, it makes sense. You need to be clear of the definition of controls in yeah. any yeah. process, right? Any process. And if the controls are defined, and you demonstrate a way that you are testing those controls. Yes. It's, it's then whether it is done by human or uh, yeah. automated, exactly. automated process, it, it shouldn't didn't, matter. It didn't matter. Okay, so my, my name okay. I, have, <laughs> <laughs> I have a very short one. Um, I get to this by asking, uh, can we audit Agile? Or do we audit the Scrum <laughs> process? So in, with Agile, we have many, different frameworks that we can apply and then we can say, okay, 
Yeah, we do we do Scrum, but we don't have a backlog. You write that <coughs> down, you have a process, you can audit that. In DevOps, DevSecOps, we don't have that yet. That's no actually that's no not bad. Yeah. It's not necessary no, no, I mean audit agile. I mean, you're you're auditing the results of yep, why, why you're you know there is a purpose behind driving agility in your organization. So how fast you're doing you you need to audit whether it's working for you, right? So if the results show that it's not working, that means you're not doing agile the just, right way. Just saying just saying that there we have a framework. Oh that you've not started that, um, Thank you. Right. Sorry, I couldn't wait. <laughs> I keep seeing it on, on the screen, so I, I couldn't wait. <laughs> please, please continue. I would like to, you. I'd like to add to what you're saying. <coughs> so I'm working in a in a somewhat rigid and you know fairly strict uh, setup right now for uh, our clients. They, they've got this is one of the first HR. You know, it's a Pathfinder project for them. And for a group where they go live once in one and a half years, we've been going live once in a week. These people, they have the foresight to bring in the auditors right in the design phase. Yeah. That's very good. Okay. And I had to, I just walked her through our entire process. So she went through the traditional setup of, okay, show me which is your, you know, how do you build and who's the deploy and role segregation and random such things. So I said, okay, time out come to our place and I showed her the entire pipeline right from how we create stories all the way to we go live, forward traceability and reverse traceability. It took her, she just, she just, the only other question she really asked was, you have all these controls, Do you, can you show me an audit trail whenever these controls change? Yeah. I said, okay, that sounds good. We showed her that. Uh, Michael was with me in that project in fact. Yeah, traceability That's is the key word. That's all that yeah. we showed yeah. and you know, we're done. We've been yeah. going live. We can today click a button and go live whenever we want in the middle of a working week. And as long as we are, we practice what's called continuous delivery. And one of the messages I've pushed is continuous delivery does not mean continuous deployment. Yeah. We do have an in-house pen tester. He does pen test whatever we are going live with. We do cho show change logs of every infrastructure automation that we do. And uh, all features, functionality, it's all traced back to requirements. And the auditors, uh, in our thing, we just breeze through in about 45 minutes to an hour when they come every month. So you know, I, I you like know, your point. Why? Yeah. Traceability is key. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. We have to show it. We, and we have to start at the beginning, Very beginning. not the end. Mm -hmm. That's why you, you should not, I, I really don't think it's a good idea to focus on audit. Yeah. Rather, you focus on complying yes, yes and of course to comply you must first know uh, what is the requirement and that should be that's why I say product owner because this is the guy holding all the requirements and he better be clear about what he wants I think not just in general auditors <coughs> during design stage I'm sure most banks also invite regulators <coughs> because whenever you introduce new ways of doing things you need Consensus for everyone. And yeah. regulators and have that standing. You, you right? engage them up front and not be scared of them. Mm -hmm. Then it's okay. So, so do they have any kind of like tools, or is it still a human process where you perform the same checks that you mentioned on uh, the slide? Regulators, they send in auditors. No, I mean, do they have any kind of like, is there any kind of automation tools, or is it a? I don't think that play space is my, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I, I could be wrong. Uh, what I have observed. Uh, the, it hasn't matured enough. Everyone is trying to Excellent. get there. Excellent. It's it's really at evolving stage. Yeah. 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 Right now we are. But playing automation in in auditing and in compliance, right? Really, uh, I I've seen a lot of applications sort of mushroom up in the last few <coughs> last one year two years. Um, but you really have to see what kind of compliance you are going for. If you are trying to comply to let's say a coding standard. That is something I think you can totally automate because it, it just have a robot look through the lines and you know some simple logic follows that finish. If you are looking at something that is uh, at the level of managing or setting processes, setting policies, no robot can do that for you. It has to be a person looking at it 
and asking the correct questions about does this fit the uh, does this fit the re- the risk appetite of the organization is it something that you know the the organization is comfortable to live with for a certain period of time before their next change or does it even match what this organization wants to achieve okay uh, if i want to deploy fast as one of my big organization objectives i wouldn't keep i wouldn't say that uh there shall only be two environments one developing uh, one development and one test no such thing you you would want some you will probably want to give as much tools as possible to your developers to get their work going along i i would like to 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 answer your question and also maybe a, an example supporting what you said that organization in in it a wide regulators and i work with thoughtworks and you know we enjoy a lot of these things actually uh, we help make sure that we speed up things for our client so one of our clients was still is actually a ticketing company in the uk called the train lines as a published case study so the train lines helps you book tickets and a lot of their competitors are today their clients so they just white label it and if you book a ticket a train ticket in the uk mostly you're on the platform we built now we have to, we had to work with an organization called the nrs you know they they are in charge of ticket reservations and our ticketing companies doing the right thing you know so one of the obstacles that we hit to deploy regularly was nrs one of the regulations was nrs has to make sure your build is right and all the all the rules are in compliance and you know citizens don't lose out or customers don't lose out by you know bad logic or whatever so we built, what we did was we understood what is it that they check for we built a tool it was it was a uh, it was a bdd sort of tool you know where you can type in in an english sort of way we invited their regulators and the auditors over showcased our intent to them and we worked and developed this with them and today whenever we have a bit i i i did the whole build pipeline automation so i can talk about this bit so all that i had to do was have an enable when the build is auto deployed have a framework pop up and you know run through all the compliance checks and just have a compliance report and all that we had to prove yeah, to so, so what were those compliance checks that you were oh these these yeah. were you know all all the nitty gritties of if you have this to kind of a ticket booking and is the is there you know a price rigging war going on or what so they had so a lot of the financial logic level you oh, were yes, yes, yes. yes. these are requirements <coughs> yeah, yeah they are yeah. regulatory okay. requirements in fact all you need to prove in this case is that you have validated the logic of you know you you're doing this automation mm-hmm. and yeah. that the that the results are consistent and repeatable <coughs> good yeah. enough good enough and even the rules set we had a revision control of it and it always with our test report say this has been validated against this rule set of this revision number that's good so we we would deploy about 3 4 times a day and it was just fine Hey guys, uh, sorry to stop you. I think we can uh, uh, we have to conclude. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.